Hello, welcome back to How to Read a Poem. Now today I'm going to do a poem called The Red and the Black. It's by the British poet Norman McKay. Now it's a poem about complexity. The complexity of the world, the complexity of human affairs. And this complexity is conveyed through utter incongruity. The incongruity of good and evil. In a sense, William Blake, a few centuries before Norman McCraig, asks the same question. How can the same God create both the meek lamb, the innocent lamb, and the ferocious death-dealing tiger? How can the same creator, how can the same world have a mix of both the good and the evil, the horrific and the peaceful? How do they belong together? And so we explore this idea through the various contrasts the poem sets up. Now look at the title to start, the red and the black. Again, we get an intuition that these two colors don't really belong together. So it's the mixture of things that don't really logically belong on the same plane, belong necessarily on the same frame of reference. How can the red and the black go together? What kind of color will that synthesis achieve? So pay attention to the contrasts that are important to the intellectual working of the poem. So let's start from the first stanza. We set up late talking. So it's framing this whole conversation within a quiet domestic space. You might think about a late night conversation. The last thing a couple talks about before they fall asleep and before they enjoy a kind of peaceful sleep. But what's presented to us? What do they talk about? Here, the imagery starts to change. Immediately, we get very stark, we get very horrifying images of the screams of the tortured. That visceral impact gets conveyed to us. And the last silence of the starving children. So it's not only that screams that gets magnified, it's also the last silence. It's also that utter helplessness of starving children. So we get kind of assaulted on our auditory senses in the first stanza of the poem. Not only we hear, we then see the faces of bigots and murderers. So in a sense, this stanza launches us into that utter intensity of evil. The poet doesn't hold back. This is the thing we're talking about. This is the thing that is wrong with the world. The screams of the people who are tortured unjustly. That total meaninglessness of suffering. That total helplessness in the face of starving children and the faces of these people who go unpunished. So where is justice in this world? Where is mercy? Where is a good God looking after the affairs of the universe? So all these questions are hinted at at the start of the first answer. So it gets presented to us and that is what we talk about. Now look at the transition to the next stanza. It's just two words. It's just one line. Then sleep. Now it's as if after we've talked about all these horrible things about the world, we can't do anything about it. And then we get a transition. It's as if it's a kind of distanciation for ourselves from the horrible reality that exists in the world. So we get a transition. We get time passing and then sleep. We need not bother ourselves with that. Sleep now descends on us almost as a kind of blessing. Look at this third stanza. The passage of time brings the morning. Of course, the morning is symbolic of hope. The morning is symbolic of a new dawn. And then there was the morning after the night after our horrible thoughts about what's wrong with the world, after the appalling injustice that exists, and then we greet the morning smiling. Note, very, very starkly, very, very importantly, the quality of the images start to change. And after juxtaposition from the first stanza, the morning greets us smiling. It's benign. There's positivity in the world. There's optimism smiling right back at us in the dance of everything. I'll get back to this phrase as a kind of master metaphor of the poem. So let's just hold on a bit. So the poet notices the morning smiling. The morning greets us with that idea of hope. The collar doves guzzle the rowan berries. So look at the word guzzle. Look at the verb. It's gentle. It's natural. Look at that contrasted too. The screams of the tortured and the silence of the starving children. In other words, a completely different picture of reality gets presented to us in the third stanza. The doves, biblical symbols of peace, biblical symbols of God's happiness with the world. Guzzle the road berries. It's that idea of eating, but it's that idea of nature's gentle working out of everything. 
and the sea washed in so gently, so tenderly. Here we get a succession of very gentle, very tender, very natural verbs that suggest to us the world opens itself to us in a positive way, in a delightful way. These are the joys of nature. So what do we want to look at? Do we want to look at the world with positivism? Do we want to look at the world with optimism? Or do we want to look at what's wrong with the world? Be a pessimist. Do we want to look at the appalling instances of injustice, of murder, of starvation? So where do we look at? The poem forces us maybe to reconcile these two viewpoints of the world. How can the red and the black belong together? How can murderers, how can starvation, how can injustice exist side by side with the plenitude of nature? with the beauty of that natural scene that's placed in front of us in the third stanza. So again, think about the contrast and how are they activated in us through the juxtapositions between the setting of the first and the third stanza and of course the words that suggest completely different qualities of atmosphere. So our neighbours greeted us with humour and friendliness. There is human comradeship. There is human warmth. There is a human community. Again, in juxtaposition to what we see in the first stanza. So again, the first and the third stanza set up a type of intellectual puzzle that the poem concerns itself with. So look at the fourth stanza. Now the tone becomes a bit more urgent. The poet presses on the question that starts to become explicit. It's been building up in the first three stanzas. So it's an address to world. We might think about this idea as an apostrophe a technique of addressing something or someone that might not be immediately present. So it's a big address to the world, or we might take it a step further, it's an address to God. So, world, why do you do this to us? Giving us poison with one hand and the bread of life with the other. Again, incongruity. World, why do you present these things to us? Giving us poison, giving us pessimism, giving us evil, giving us suffering on one hand, and then on the other, giving us the bread of life, giving us hope, giving us optimism. So why do you do this? There seems to be no logical way in which we can reconcile the dizzying possibilities that the world presents to us. There seems to be no logical way in which good and evil can exist in the same plane of existence. There seems to be no logical possibility. Why, in a world where children go starving, birds, doves, guzzle, the roan, berries, and the sea washes in so gently, so tenderly. So, it's a rhetorical question, highlighting the poet's point, the incongruity of it all, the craziness of it all, the world being incorrigibly plural. And maybe that plurality is a thing to be celebrated. Maybe life isn't to be treated in a simplistic way, in a one-sided way. Maybe behind that idea of hope, which is the question being asked. Hope only makes sense because there is the threat of darkness. And so in the face of evil, remember the poet starts off with the negative side. So in the face of evil, in the face of suffering, in the face of injustice, can we still find that anchor in life? Can we still find a sense of hope? And then the last answer wraps the whole idea up for us and reason sits helpless at his desk. So it's something about the world that doesn't seem logical, that reason is helpless at, that we can't approach logically, that perhaps we can't approach in a sort of positive versus negative way, in a binaristic way. Reason sits helpless at his desk, adding accounts that never balance. Note the word balance. It's something that has always happened. That good and evil can't really square up against each other. That logic finds it impossible to reconcile, to put together these two views of humanity, these two views of the world. So reason is adding up accounts, but it's a futile exercise because these accounts never balance. There's always going to be an excess of the bad versus there's always going to be an excess of the good. Again, it depends on how we look at the world and how we approach each other and how we think about these big questions in life. And reason at the end finds no excuse for anything. It's almost as if the views of the world presented in the poems are unjustifiable. There's no excuse. There's no reason why the world should be thus. And so therefore, we see in this poem, 
The poem is an intellectual way in which to approach what seems to us to be fundamental questions about life, about the world, about morality. This poem approaches these big questions using contrasts and using that rhetorical question in stanza 4 to kind of activate our thinking, to get us puzzling about how can good and evil really coexist in the same world. And again, if we look at the world in a complex way, if we don't look at the world in a simplistic way, if we don't approach the world in a binaristic way, we find that perhaps the world opens itself to us. Hamlet says there is more in heaven and hell than is in any person's philosophy. So there is more to think about the world than we can conceptualize, than we can intellectually reduce maybe, than we can rationalize away. This has been How to Read a Poem. Thank you.